In today's program, we'll be visiting the southwest corner of this beautiful country, traveling by train from London down to Penzance. There we'll be staying a few days with our group from Hawaii, traveling along on a tour of Great Britain. This is the beginning of our tour. We'll be continuing on up through England and up to Scotland and over to Ireland later in the series. But today's program will be focusing on the first leg of our journey, starting out in this very comfortable first-class Brit Rail train, going down to Penzance. It's 280 miles from London, so it takes most of the day to get there, but you can do it in royal comfort, gliding along on the smooth rails and enjoying meals and scenic views out the window. On one side of the train, we enjoyed a lot of water views, and on the other side, views of the farmlands and the interior villages along the way. Going by train is very comfortable and smooth cruising. It's air conditioned, it's quiet, you can get up and walk around, perhaps meet some fellow travelers, and then soon enough you've arrived at your destination. In this case, we've gotten to Penzance. Into our taxis and on the way to our hotel. It's only about one mile. This is a fairly small town and a cute town. It's a shopping place. There's pedestrian areas. There's a little seafront promenade. And our hotel is the Queen's Hotel. It's one of the classic places in town. There's a lot of antiques and original artworks inside the hotel and very comfortable lobby. We'll be staying here for a couple of days and using this as a base for seeing the surrounding countryside as well. Nice to come back to the room and rest up and then hop on a bus, go out for the afternoon, back to the hotel and so forth. And it's easy walking distance from Queen's Hotel right into the heart of Penzance. It's a town that's lined with charming stone buildings and festive atmosphere in the shopping area. Standing in front of the Egyptian house, this is an oddity. Looks like an Egyptian tomb of some kind or temple. It was built in 1835 and it stands on Chapel Street, which is one of the more interesting roads in town, lined with a variety of curious buildings, including the oldest pub in this region of the country. Turk's Head dates back to the 13th century and reputedly was set up by the Turks when they first came to visit England. That's one of the legends, one of the many myths about this area. There's also legends that the ancient Assyrians and the Phoenicians also visited this part of England and mined some tin from the areas. Another pub on Chapel Street is the Admiral Benbow Inn, which was founded in 1696. And up on the roof, there's a pirate. You've heard of the Pirates of Penzance, the Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. Well, apparently there were pirates here in the old days. Little boat harbor. We'll be visiting some of the nearby villages, including Mausel. Looks like Mouse Hole, but they say Mausel. So we get on our public bus. It's a double-decker bus. And begin our explorations of the surrounding region. The first place we want to visit is the last place in England. It's Land's End. And along the way, there's quite some interesting sites. There's farmlands, and there's a historic stone circle here, very similar to that at Stonehenge in Avesbury. Cows all lined up, heading to greener pastures. It's quite remarkable that megalithic ruins like the stone circles have survived all this time for they were probably first constructed about five or six thousand years ago and they've been standing there all that time. Those early people were farmers and today farming is still important to the area. Well it's three miles to go to Land's End. We've come nine miles from Penzance. It just takes about a half an hour to make this trip on the local bus. It makes a few stops along the way of course. And the price is right, the round trip is under $5 from Penzance down to Land's End and buses run every half hour, so it's a very convenient way to travel. And you get to see a lot of nice scenery, especially when you're in the upper deck of that bus. Tourism is quite important to the area, particularly in the season, anytime say between April and October. It gets busiest in the summer months, of course. One of the main reasons why people come here is to reach this point, the end of the road, Land's End. It's quite an accomplishment to get here. It's like climbing a mountain and reaching the top. 
This is Dennis Callan for World Traveler, taking you to Land's End. We're at the southwest tip of England. It's a spectacular sight with the cliffs dropping to the ocean. The next piece of land is America, over 3,000 miles away. So we've come to the end of the road here, bringing you more sights for World Traveler. You can keep walking along this scenic coastal path all the way to Scotland. But that's almost 900 miles, so that's too far for us, of course. We're just going to walk out on this suspension bridge and have a look straight down. It's a dramatic view. You're looking down a couple of hundred feet right down this rocky cliff with hundreds of seagulls flying by and squawking and beautiful wildflowers on the hills at this time of the year. We've arrived in early summer as we like to travel in England and April and May is a great time to go. June is fine. Actually, England is fine all summer long if you want to go in July or even August. It doesn't usually get that hot. The sign says dangerous cliffs, and they certainly can be, but this is a very soft adventure. It's easy, easy stuff here to walk along the path and have a great look out over this vista. The westernmost point of England. You can call it the end of England if you're looking west, or if you're just arriving, it's the beginning of England. Depends on your perspective, whether you're coming or going. There are some little tourist attractions constructed here at Land's End. There's a little train that can take you around. There's a restaurant. The hotel's been reopened. There's some little games and rides for the kids. And frankly, some of it is a bit tacky. But don't let that stop you from the Land's End experience, because as you've just seen, it was quite worthwhile. We've rendezvoused once again with our public bus, connecting with the timetable, always accurate on schedule, and we're on our way back towards Penzance, enjoying more of the rolling farmlands. This is a rural type of neighborhood. There's little villages with the country church in the middle of the square. It's a quiet place, mostly farming and grazing, and some tourists. We're here at the beginning of the summer, so it's a little bit less crowded. The roads are not bad at all. If you want to drive, well, you've got to drive on the left side of the road here in England. It's the wrong side for us, so it's easier to let somebody else do the driving for you so you can relax and concentrate on the view and your fellow passengers. Arriving at one of the prettiest little fishing villages along this Cornwall coastline, it's as cute as its name, which is Mouse Hole. The locals pronounce it Mausel, and it's got a little sandy beach here in its artificial harbor. That stone breakwater dates back to the 14th century. These cute little stone buildings of town date back several hundred years. Many of them were rebuilt after Spanish invasions in the 17th century. There's no more invasions except by tourists, so this has become a very peaceful and bucolic spot to kick back and sit on a bench and enjoy a view of this little harbor. It's so perfect it belongs on a postcard and yes you can buy postcards of Mausel right in the little gift shops in town. You can also get a bite to eat. There's a number of restaurants here that serve quite tasty foods. Of course seafoods is one of their specialties. These well-fed seagulls are just kicking back enjoying the view. Looks like they're looking up in the sky at their friends flying around. If you really fell in love with Mausel, you could stay here for a few days. There are several small bed and breakfasts and guest houses here. But we're just a few miles from Penzance, which is a better place to stay. And a few miles beyond Penzance is Mount St. Michael's, you see here in the distance. We'll be traveling down there in just a few minutes in the program. It's quite an interesting island with an amazing history. This entire coastline has got quite a history which involves smugglers. In the old days, apparently, there was a lot of smuggling going on here in Cornwall. These little indented coves and harbors and little valley bay mouths made ideal grounds for smuggling goods ashore. Back in the old days, the main way the governments would raise money was from levying a fee on imported goods rather than an income tax or a sales tax as we have today. So imported goods had 
quite a stiff tax, and it was very profitable to be a smuggler. Hmm, a tasty light lunch with a view of the water, and then we're back on our bus and on our way back to Penzance. And there we change buses and continue on to what is probably the most picturesque and famous of the villages of Cornwall, going from Mausel to St. Ives. Penzance is a very convenient place to stay because of its good bus connections, its train connections, a variety of hotels of different sizes. Here you see downtown Penzance and there's a good number of restaurants here. And the other sites, including St. Ives, are really quite close. Just a half an hour away, you'll be in St. Ives or Land's End or Mount St. Michael, where we're heading after St. Ives. On our Hawaii Geographic Society tours, we often like to travel among the locals. This gives you a much better feeling for what life is like in the regions that you're traveling through. And in most cases, it's very convenient it's quick, it's clean, and it's inexpensive. It's a great way to get around. Take the public bus, or subways in the big cities, or trains between the big cities. That's how we like to travel. And then we do a lot of walking once we arrive in a destination, which is really the, the best, the most ultimate way to see any place, particularly in a little village like St. Ives. You just get out and walk around. This is one of the charming spots of England. It's famous as an artist's refuge. It's also a little surf town. There's beaches on both sides of the town. St. Ives has two important art museums. There's a branch of the Tate Gallery from London, and there's the Barbara Hepworth Museum, who was a noted sculptor who lived in the area. Of course, there's a number of excellent restaurants in town and a wide variety of shopping. The center of the village is largely for the pedestrian. There's very few cars that come through here, so it makes for a quiet, delightful shopping and strolling ambiance. The population of St. Ives is quite small, just about 10,000 permanent residents, and in the wintertime there'd be even less. So it's a small village, easy to get around. You can see the whole place in an afternoon. And there's some art galleries here as well. For a small town, St. Ives had an impact on the history of art in the 20th century, especially during the 1920s. A band of artists got together here and began refining the development of abstract art, abstract paintings and geometric shapes. And you can still see a lot of their work on exhibit in the two museums, the Hepworth Museum and the Tate Gallery. This artistic port has been a favorite of painters and sculptors over many years, attracted by the cobbled streets and the quaint cottages and the romantic landscapes. Today it's a well-kept town. It's very clean and tidy. The gardens are beautiful, as most British gardens are, and it has a waterfront promenade as well. So by all means, when you're in Cornwall, you should get over and have a look at St. Ives. It's located on the northern coast of the Cornwall Peninsula, which means it's a little bit more cloudy and windy, a little bit more rugged than the southern coast where Penzance is located. Now we've traveled by public bus a few miles back to Penzance. It's sunnier already, and we're heading out to St. Michael's Mount. This is the other must-see in the area. It's a spectacular fortified island that has a history dating back 2,000 years. We pay a small fee to the boatman to take us out here, or when the tide is low, you can actually walk, as you'll see in a few minutes. Climbing up the steep walkway to the castle is the dues you pay for getting to St. Michael's Mount, but it's worth the price because the view is spectacular and the castle looks like it's something right out of a fairy tale. Of course, no castle is complete without cannons, and here they are to make the picture perfect. After all, the mount did function as a military fortress to keep, among others, the Spanish invaders at bay. And finally, by 1647, it was retired from active military duty and became a private residence, which it 
has remained right up until this date. St. Michael's Mount is privately owned, although it's operated by the National Trust and it's one of the most visited sites in the entire National Trust inventory. The Chevy Chase dining room, there's a mix of architectural styles ranging from the 14th century right up to the 19th century inside and outside St. Michael's Mount. The island's believed to have been first occupied 2,000 years ago by Mediterranean tin traders. And then in the year 500, the Archangel Michael was sighted at the top of the mount, according to a Cornish legend. After this sighting, the island became a place of pilgrimage, and a Celtic monastery was established here. When the Normans conquered England in 1066, they noted the similarity between this island and that of Mont Saint-Michel in Normandy. And with that, the Normans decided to establish a Benedictine monastery, so they sent one of the chief monks from Mont Saint-Michel to establish what became St. Michael's Mount. Are they walking on water? This is a miraculous place. Wonderful things can happen to you when you visit St. Michael's Mount, including the thrill of sloshing through ankle-deep water. Or if you've arrived at high tide, you take the boat. You see, there's a granite pathway, and at low tide, you can walk or drive, and at mid-tide, you can make a choice and take your chances. If the tide's going out, it's no problem. As you'll see here, the pathway becomes more and more evident and becomes high and dry, so it's an easy stroll. It's less than a mile offshore, but if the tide's coming in, well, then you take the boat. And from here, we take the bus back on our city bus, which has convenient connections from the mount back into Penzance town. Some final views of Penzance as we make our way back to the hotel. And then we'll be soon leaving and heading to Bath. The rest of our program will be devoted to the beautiful Georgian town of Bath. The Queen's Hotel is a nice place to stay when you're in Penzance. Yeah. It's very comfy, just like home. They've got newspapers and a nice little travel library in the lounge. And here's the breakfast room. Breakfast is always included on our travels with the Hawaii Geographic Society. And you'll find that in, in most European hotels, breakfast is included in the room rate. Makes it all very convenient. From the hotel, we take a short taxi ride off to the train station. And here we reminisce about our visit to Penzance. Penzance is just lovely. Um, a little resort town, but you know, uh, it depends on us tourists. It's a lovely seaside town. Nice people. Oh, a fine town. It's more than just a resort town where tourists come. It's obvious that the folks that live here enjoy living here. Um, this was also a chance to really see the countryside up close and personal by riding the buses uh, over Hill and Dale on our way to Land's End, mm -hmm. which was uh, absolutely fan fantastic. And the weather was just perfect for us. They just had great weather. Oh, loved Penzance and loved it all. But I think that uh, St. Ives is my favorite place. I'd like to come back to St. Ives again. The ambience and reminded me a little bit of a Swiss town. I'm very fond of Switzerland. There's just something set on the ocean, but it was a Swiss town set on the ocean. <laughs> well, I, I like uh, the St. Ives very, very much, and I found my little tea cloth of the, with a nursery rhyme poem on it in St. Ives in a little store called the Cat's Whiskers. <laughs> I like the place, very clean, and uh, the place we went yesterday, it's a very nice place. Oh, it's beautiful, a uh, nice place, nice country, it's the weather good, not too hot, not too cold, and I like the people. Mm -hmm. They speak English, I understand them, they understand me, so it's a wonderful vacation. Well, as a matter of fact, I liked Mausel, because it just appealed to me, just a cute little town. Well, it, it's just one of those little, um, like, like some of the villages in Devon, set on the uh, seaside on a hill, and it's great fun. Mausel was very um, picturesque. I like that. That was nice. Small, contained, the little, the little cove with the boats. That was very pretty. And we had perfect weather. 
it's very scenic, very picturesque, nice and peaceful after the hustle and bustle of London, definitely. <laughs> I went up to St. Michael's Mount. That is worth doing. That, that's a beautiful, the castle is gorgeous. It's, it's quite a climb though. <laughs> that's, that was an interesting climb, but it's, it's worth doing. We bid a fond farewell to St. Michael's Mount, to Penzance, goodbye to Land's End and St. Ives and Mausel. It was a very nice start to our tour of Great Britain. And now we continue to our next destination, the beautiful city of Bath, where we'll spend the rest of our program in today's World Traveler. In future episodes of World Traveler, we'll continue with the tour our trip traveled north from Bath up to York, stayed a few days there, all traveling by train, which as you can see is a very comfortable way to go. From York, we went to the Lake District, stayed in Windermere. Here's a view of Plymouth. Even today, it's an important naval town. There's an active shipyard still in business here at Plymouth. For 600 years, Plymouth has been a naval town. It's been a place where adventurers and explorers left from, including Captain Cook, Sir Francis Drake, and of course the Pilgrim Fathers left from Plymouth to travel to Massachusetts and establish their town of the same name. There's snack cars on board, there's a dining car on board the train, and stunning views along the Cornish Riviera, as they call this beautiful scenic coastline dotted with beaches and piers and little fishing harbors, amusement parks and coastal wetlands. 